Hi there. Good afternoon. So um, last week at Foster's, we um, had a celebration last Monday night for our new associates, um, effectively our new um, leaders of the future. And I had been asked to come here and talk to you today um, about leader, leading, uh, leading in practice. And I started to think about my own experiences um, in my journey at Foster and Partners. I've been with Foster and Partners uh, about 16 years. I had a fair bit of experience before I joined. And so after a few years, I was probably around 30, I was asked to lead a project. And I'd had some responsibility for packages or I'd maybe managed some architects who were more junior to me, but I hadn't led a project before. And I remember feeling completely overwhelmed. <laughs> Um, suddenly I, hate, I had eight or ten people who were asking me what to do. The reason I was leading that project was because I had um, very good experience in residential. So everybody was looking to me to, to specifically lead the unit plans. So I had a task to do, but I couldn't get on with it because everybody was interrupting me, and they were asking me what they should be doing. I couldn't get ahead, so I started going to work earlier, stopped having lunch, because then they disappeared. I had a bit of time. Um, <laughs> sounds familiar. Um, and, uh, and, and one day I went into work, and I did this. And this took 20 minutes, and pretty much in those 20 minutes, I transitioned into leadership. Um, um, what I mean by that is I realise that the quality of, what, of my thought is my most um, important asset, the biggest value added that I can give. So in 20 minutes, if I can go away and be strategic and stop thinking about a task at hand, and usually in your first leadership role, you're actually having to balance both. Um, and so within that 20 minutes, I, my uh, managing, the, the partner in charge, I could see he was feeling pretty nervous about the decision of having made me the, the team leader. He, he looked like he was much more confident and the team um, looked and behaved more confidently because they thought I, you know, had, had it. I had to, I'd worked out, you know, what we should all be doing. So leadership in practice. Um, what does that really mean um, for architects? Um, there are quite a lot of blue sky thinkers in the world, uh, but not many of them actually have to make that thinking into something real, and that's what we have to do. And it's really complicated. Uh, we have to deal with a lot of collaborating experts uh, to make that thinking real. But at the same time, because the communication of our, of our ideas is so important, we're also managing and leading a whole other group of people to produce communication information, whether that's films, models, drawings, Photoshop plans, whatever. All those people require leadership simultaneously. And this structure is, is probably um, it's, it's common in everything that we do. Um, and the actual projects come in all different shapes and sizes and complexity. So these are two projects that I'm working on at the moment. One is a fairly small scale project. It's uh, at London Zoo, the Snowden Avery. And the other is uh, a global headquarters in New York. And, and you can see that the, we are the protagonist, if you like. We're in the middle. And, and we're responsible for leading the workflow. But from project to project, that varies. And so when I structure a team, I think about these complexities. Another important uh, part is, is how does the client, how is the client structured? How is the decision-making process for the client led? So again, taking uh, my um, project at London Zoo, which is uh, my client, or part of my client is a monkey. So uh, that's something I have to respond to. And I'll tell you more about that later. But this is the, the decision-making process of the client. You know, it's quite tight, and my team in response is, is a fairly tight, small team. The global headquarters in, uh, in New York has a much more complicated structure. Um, there are a zillion project managers, um, and, and I have to form a team that can manage all that communication and information. 
So I mentioned that uh, um, the Snowden Avery. So I thought uh, probably because it's a it's a huge subject, and I wanted to be fairly practical about uh, how I talk about this. So I thought I'll take one project um, and, and talk you through uh, how I structured the team um, and how we work together. So. I'll give you a quick overview of the project, I'll try not to talk about the design, um, but just so you can contextualise um, how the team operates. So the Snowden Avery is in London Zoo. Uh, the zoo uh, has an amazing heritage of uh, modernist architecture. Um, and they held a competition about two years ago. They were looking for um, an architect to restore and repurpose the Snowden Avery. So this is the Snowden Avery. It's the only example of a tensegrity structure um, in, in, in the UK. It has a particular importance for, for our practice. The sort of philosophies behind this go all the way back to Buckminster Fuller, and that's a very important part of our heritage. Um, he was Norman's teacher and mentor. So today, uh, the Avery's looking a little tired. Um, and as I say, the first part of the first element in this project was to restore it. It's very specialist. In fact, um, it's quite unusual that the project is an absolute collaboration between architecture and engineering. And the two people who created this were Cedric Price and Frank Newby. And, and that would become a very important part of our response to the project, to our relationship with our engineer. This is our client. Oh, um, it's, a, it's a troop of colobus monkeys, um, so the birds are going, and then it's, the monkeys are going to arrive. They have all their requirements uh, that we've been learning about. And the project, if I can just describe it in terms of its elements, so there's the aviary itself, which is a restoration. The monkeys will be moved here. They have requirements, which means we have to create um, an ancillary building. That's a new structure. And... The third element is a community centre, which is an educational building. And just so it's clear um, in terms of you understand the composition of the master plan. So uh, this is how I went around building my team for this. So this, these are, this is not the whole team, but this is the, these are the key players. And Eduardo and Jan are here with me. Uh, they're both associates uh, uh, at Foster's and um, they are happy to take your questions about their um, experience in leadership in this project. So first of all, Eduardo. Uh, so Eduardo's a qualified architect. Uh, he's a good architect. He and I have worked together in the past to deliver a project, though he wasn't in a leadership role. He had a lot of responsibility and I think, or at the time I thought, he was ready to take on um, leadership. The project that he worked on uh, was a timber project and he got really good experience in timber construction, which was going to be really important for this project. Um, I, uh, I, in terms of where he was, as I say, I think he was ready to, to, to step, because I'd seen the way he'd performed, I thought he was ready to step up and be the leader of a project. He has... Good soft skills. I, I know that I can trust him with a client. I know he's, and I know he's, he's quite diplomatic. Sachi uh, is a graduate that's been working with us, or at the time had been working with us for about two years. She had moved around on projects, mainly working on the, the earlier stages. She's at a point where she wants to get her part three. She started studying her part three, and she needs long-term experience on a project, and she needs experience, particularly in the latter stages. This is a project in London, it's a perfect project for, and it has, you know, it's a listed building, it has all, it's in a, a Royal Parks, it's got all sorts of ingredients that make it a really good part three project. Um, she is um, a very clear thinker, she's very organised and linear, and Eduardo will tell you that that is not his greatest strength, so, um, so Sachi I would expect to take on a stronger role in those aspects and collaborate with Eduardo. Conversely, she's not, at the time, she didn't feel very confident about her technical knowledge because she's only had a couple of years' experience. I've seen her and Eduardo work together in the past and I think he would be a really good mentor to help her through that. <coughs> um, so this was the competition scheme. 
which was the, the monkey house was, was a cube. And as, it, as the project developed, it became a complex structure. It's a, a laminated bamboo um, grid shell. It's unprecedented. And, it, and it's really, um, it, the reason they had such an architectural competition is because they're looking for a new piece of architecture to add to their portfolio. So as the project developed towards this, I could see it was outside um, the skills of the core team. Um, and so this is Jan, and Jan doesn't work in an architectural studio. Uh, Jan is a specialist. He is an architect, he's a qualified architect, and he's an associate, but he specializes in complex geometry, digital construction. He can tell you exactly what that term means. Um, and um, and he, he, he breaks down complex problems into con constructible parts as, as part of his job. So, um, so I went to Jan and I said, can you, can you support us on this? And over um, a few months, it was obvious that Jan took the project, as pa took it on as passionately as my team. He was really championing the project. And I thought, you know, he works on a lot of different projects in a specialist manner. But in terms of the next stage of his career, um, it would be great for him to, to take that work all the way to the end and interface with people in industry and, and, and the people who are going to construct this. And so he was happy to move into the team. So he actually physically moved um, over, over to our side, as it were. Um, as I said, we did have a fairly, uh, this, this building became fairly complex. So I think you spoke about redundancy. So I um, oversee several projects at any one time. And so I have a structure for this team with Eduardo leading it, and that frees me up to do other things. Um, and at the time when the tender documents were being produced, I was very, very absorbed in a really important bid. And I could see in the team that they weren't feeling so confident. Um, they were feeling a bit out of their depth and they needed more support um, in this final stage. And I didn't have the time uh, to support them in the way that would be sufficient. So I, uh, this, was, this is Gregor, who actually, who, who's been at Foster's a lot longer than I have. And I'd actually never spoken to him, but I'd heard about him. So I went to speak to Gregor, and he is um, an old hand. Uh, as you can see, he was, um, he's been um, involved in some buildings that go quite far back. But he's an old hand at Foster's. He's built a lot of buildings. He loves detailing construction. He loves fighting with contractors. He loves doing planning meetings. And I thought, and I, I said, could you, it, it's just a small moment in time, but could you support the team and keep an eye on it. I just need to, they've got planning meetings, you know, the, the, the drawings need checked. Can you just make sure it's going in the right direction? Which he was happy to do. And then, and I'm starting to think, actually, you know, maybe, maybe Gregor should have a specialist role in our studio where he does that on, on all of our projects because he has such experience. Um, so that's a conversation I'm sort of having with him at the moment. Um, and so, and so that's how the team works, the, the key players, if you like. Sachi uh, works on one building. That's her baby. It's the education center. Jan, as I've said, he's, he's the person that's going to take a very complex piece of innovation and make it happen physically uh, with the construction industry. Um, Gregor is sort of making sure everybody's delivering in a safe way. Um, and Eduardo... Runs, runs the team. Um, I, as I said, I, this is, I oversee, and, and obviously Norman, who is, who is very involved in the design, um, doesn't necessarily see us on a sort of day-to-day -day, uh, basis. So, um, having established my team, the structure, everybody knows their roles and responsibilities, what's the glue that holds that together? Um, so I think as you evolve as an architect, you start to understand what type of architect you are and where your strengths are uh, and where your weaknesses might lie. And it's kind of the same with leadership. You start to create your own personal style. Uh, my style, um, I'm about empowerment. 
I think that we um, employ really fantastic people and we go to great lengths to find talent, so I'm not going to tell them how to think. Um, I, um, I give them space uh, to go away and experiment, and I make sure there's a margin in there for error. Um, and explore their ideas within a framework, within a time framework. Um, I also, um, I have pretty high standards. Um, I expect them to have done some really hard thinking before I come and review. I'm, um, I'd say I'm quite firm and um, I'm definitely direct uh, in my communication. Um, now, I don't know what, exactly what Eduardo's personal style is because I don't micromanage him, but I do expect him to work within the climate that I've, that I've set up. I think that nothing new happens unless you allow an element of risk and experiment. So I, I try to do that in a controlled way. And then how do we, um, what's our communication system um, within the team? So the first thing is, and I'm sure it's the same for you, most of us work in open plan offices. Um, it's, it's kind of a necessity of our job. We need to be able to work in teams, not silos. We have, we, impromptu communication is, is just part of what we do, but, which is great. But with that, I, there comes, um, you have to limit it as well. Uh, you need to control it. So, for example, I, I sit in an open plan office. I'm very accessible. People can talk to me whenever they want. But I have to enforce a discipline that that doesn't just become ineffective. They're passing by and they just go, oh, can you look at this? Or, you know, what do you think about that? Because I'm not really going to be thinking um, effectively about the question they've asked me because I'm not really that focused. I'm probably focused on something else. So I have to be disciplined about it. Um, and... Um, and oftentimes I have to take myself off somewhere else so that I can just be in isolation and, and think well. Um, so I, uh, Eduardo and the team talk every day. They sit together and they talk every day. I probably talk to the team formally about once a week. Uh, but, but I do, um, I am open whenever Eduardo wants to come and see me. He just, he knows he can talk to me anytime. You know, just ask me when and we'll sit down because I do expect that Eduardo will make mistakes. He's not done, he's really supported, but he hasn't done what he's doing before, so he will make mistakes. And it's important that I catch them and he feels safe that he can tell me when he thinks something's going in the wrong direction, um, and then I can get it back on track. So in terms of the day-to-day the -day, uh, delivery of the project, if you like, uh, Eduardo and the team communicate with the, the client and consultants on a day-to-day -day basis. Over two years, they've built up a, a really super relationship with the client. It, it's super functional. Uh, but every now and again, we hit a bump and there's difficult conversations that have to be had. And that's my job. Uh, so... They'll come to me, they'll say, oh, you know, there's a budget issue or <clears throat> they're pushing back too hard on us, you know, or, or they're blaming us for this, you know. So it's my job to go in and, and talk, do the difficult conversations because it keeps their relationship intact with the, sort of, with, with, with the, the client's everyday team. Um, and then, as I say, Norman is very involved in the project, in the design still, but he's, you know, he's also operating at, at a different level as well in terms of the client group. So um, I think, um, before I finish, um, what I think the sort of, I mean, it's such, oops, it's such a complex, um, I mean, architecture, just to start with, in any project, is hugely complicated. So I've tried to, to take a small part of it and simplify it, but if I, I could summarize it in some considerations, I really do think that the quality of your thought, the ability to think well and strategize and really think about the problem at hand, what you need to do and how you're gonna get there Everything else after that is dependent. And that's not just the project, it's also the success of the businesses that you work for. Um, 
structure, teams should be structured, and everybody should have clear roles and objectives. Um, I've talked about climate, you've also talked about climate, but you, you have to decide that yourselves, but it has to be a climate that, that gets the best results. And that, to me, means that it's a, it's a sort of a balance of control and freedom. Um, and also the, the communication side is very important. And personal development. So um, I think that the team will deliver the project, but the project will deliver the team of the future. Everybody that's working um, on a project should feel by the end of it that they've got something back. And I just thought, it's just behind this, so you can see behind the scenes. So 10 years ago, well, it's a bit more than 10 years ago, actually. But, you know, I had my first experience in leadership and I sort of found my way of dealing with that. So when I was asked to do this, um, to do this lecture, it's the same thing. I was actually in, in our New York office and I hid in a room and I started to sort of map it out and then people interrupted me. You know, and, and I, I'd, I'd wrote a note to myself that said, I've been in the room 15 minutes, three people have asked me for a private conversation, and one person is waiting for me to give them some slides to, to create. Um, but it's the same thing. I had to find my space that I can actually go away, sit in isolation, and map out what it is, where's the start, where's the finish, and how am I going to get there? And I, uh, one of the most satisfying thing for me is working with my teams. I think um, I measure my own success by their success. And we have a lot of difficult conversations along the way, but we also celebrate when we do a good job. Um, so the other side of it is important to, you are a team, and it is important to enjoy the celebratory side of things as well. And finally, um, I, I guess I'd just like to say there has been a privilege uh, to be here in, in front of you guys who effectively are the future leaders, but you're also the, the future talent of our industry. And that's done. But I'd just like to say, can I ask Eduardo and Jan if they can come up? Because I wanted to leave enough, enough time for questions. Um, on, on the way here, actually, uh, sorry, on the, way, on the way here when we were just in the car chatting, they've just finished tender. Um, and, uh, and otherwise they really wouldn't be here. Um, and uh, so we were chatting in the car, and I think we were in the car for about 25 minutes, and the whole 25 minutes, you know, they were talking about what their experience on that project, what the real frustrations were, what the good things were, what they do differently. Uh, and it was really interesting. So I would really, you know, encourage you to, to direct questions at these guys as well. Welcome onto the stage. I think the Mentimeter's already um, starting to up. I'm going to kick off with one of my own questions. Um, I thought your summary around um, teams um, delivering projects and projects delivering future teams was, was fantastic, actually. And that, that came through very clearly, the fact that when you built the team for this project, you actually seem to start with the needs of the team members and their development needs and their career development needs before then looking at the project needs. And I just wondered to all of you actually, how does that balancing act work um, in terms of that sort of sweet spot between getting what the project needs, but also constantly being that kind of in that stretch zone where you're enabling new talent to rise up through the ranks? It must take, you know, require quite a long-term view. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's really because I know my team. So if somebody comes to the office new, um, I'll integrate them probably into a, a large team and then sort of put them somewhere that's fairly safe but challenging and then and little by little you start to sort of understand uh, where their strengths are and where their passion is because basically if somebody's passionate um, that's I mean that's probably 70 percent of that's probably is 70 percent of the battle um, so um, so I'm quite lucky in that respect because I oversee a lot of teams and I have quite a broad range of of people. I suppose it's, it's a similar answer. I, uh, I think there's a sweet spot between what you know how to do and and what you don't know how to do. And in, in that transition is where you perform best. It's when you really are 
intrigued by what you're doing, but at the same time uh, a, a little bit uncertain. Once you know how to do it, if you have to do it again, I don't think you perform in the same way. So if they catch you right in the right moment with the right project, I think you give as much as you can. And, and most, of, most projects are all about that, uh, showing the rest of the people involved you know that you've got a real drive uh, to, to get it done. Uh, at least that's my experience. I don't, I don't know what's yours. Yeah, I, I think when you're in a team, it's really important that you kind of are aware of what you're very good at and make others aware of what you're very good at, but also be very honest with yourself and everyone what you're kind of less good at and that you potentially want to improve and kind of find each other's strengths and weaknesses. I feel like Eduardo and I, we really complement each other on many things and we're also very honest and open to each other. When I have a problem, I will go, Eduardo, this is, this is not working. And when he has a problem, he will come to me and we just kind of lift each other up. And I think that's really important when you're working in a team or as a manager. There's a few interesting questions coming through on the Mentimeter. I don't know if you want to take one of them or whether I should pick one off for you. Actually, I'm just too busy. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it is the thing about making yourself um, redundant uh, because there, there's always somewhere where, where my strengths can go and I, I have to trust people, but I'm actually just too busy uh, to micromanage people. And what about this? There's an interesting question here about creating that safe environment. You talked about a safe environment. This is part of the kind of team climate. What do you think it takes to create that climate which enables people to, 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 to kind of share with you challenges? I'll, I'll let you guys answer that because... So you can see that they're, they're not scared. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I don't know. I suppose that uh, it's really personal, the relationship you have with, a, with, a, with your line manager, the person, the people you, you work with. Um, I'm not sure it's always uh, extremely easy to tell what works. It's just why do people kind of sympathize or connect or whatever with other people? Um, in this case, I think, I think we do, uh, and I know where the boundaries are. I, you kind of learn what the other person considers important and where you have a little bit more freedom to do what you, what you think is best. I don't know, I find it, it's really personal and I'm not sure it can be kind of simplified and you can provide one environment that's good for everybody. Um, I suppose, uh, you know, uh, Kirsten's strength is to un identify what is good for each of the people she works with and, and um, at least I've, I felt that she had identified my weaknesses, many, and whatever my strengths are, uh, and, and she doesn't rely on me getting the things I always get wrong right because that would be a disaster. I think one of the things you said in your, in your talk is about when you're a manager, you need to make yourself redundant. And that's something that I, that I, I get along with Kirsten very well and I respect her very much as, as an architect and as a manager. And what I really like is that I feel that she's trying to lift me up. I come from a different team. She knew me a little bit from a different project and she is, you seem very passionate, are you willing to, to take this role and, and be in this project much more involved. And that's kind of a risk that she took that I really appreciate. And also just the fact that she, she lets us do what we, what we want to do when we are trying to achieve something and then is there when it actually doesn't work to, to support us. So we have this freedom, but also this safety net. And I think that's very important and that's something that I really appreciate. And the fact that she's usually very honest and very direct in that makes certain things much more efficient. <laughs> a little too honest sometimes. <laughs> um, there's a question there about it too, too I feel uh, it's a, uh, that I'm not keeping up with developing tech. Not BIM, I stopped, a V8 microstation. Um, I'm completely unemployable in, uh, in, in any of those things. It's just not realistic. Uh, it's kind of sad in a way. But um, I, I, ha I mean, I was brought up with hand drawing, so I do actually, um, I'm very hands-on in that way. I constantly do sketch and hand drawings uh, and design. Uh, I just don't use the, the software anymore. When I, when I hear the word BIM, because I'm kind of in our research and development department, I always want to say something. First of all, I think it's very important I use the right tool for the right purpose. So you don't necessarily need to do an, an not developed early sketch design in a BIM package, not necessary. And the second thing I wanted to say was that my other manager, who's the head of the R&D team, barely knows how to switch on a computer. 
and it is actually not really necessary as long as this person trusts the people in the team to understand what they are doing on their level and enable them on her or his level. I'd like, I'd like as well, Dave, if possible, to answer the question about your experience of stepping up into a leadership role, because I think that's probably incredibly pertinent um, to the people in this room. So your kind of experience of what worked, what didn't work, what mistakes did you make, and actually also what did you learn from seeing Kirsten's leadership style? Well, I suppose I, I really identify with uh, that period of time when you said that you were uh, asked to lead uh, a group of people. Uh, I'm not leading 10 people, it's a very small team, but I constantly struggle with having to perform a task of my own and trying to make sure that everybody else is doing something that is in the right direction and that we're not you know, um, duplicating tasks and everybody knows. I find it extremely challenging. I find most of the time that I, I, I answer questions all day and then at some point when I should probably be going home, I can get on and do my own task. And I think that's just my mistake for not having identified that I can't really be doing that. Uh, and I'm in that transition yet, but I'm finding it very difficult to let go and, and say, well, you know, somebody else will deal with this. I need to concentrate on, on understanding what everybody else is doing. So I'm, I'm exactly right at that, at that point. And from the previous project, uh, I didn't have a, um, uh, the same role, but the project was kind of split. So I was more on my own with a, another couple uh, team members. Um, so uh, I kind of had a little taste of that at the last stages. So it's gradual. I don't think suddenly you're not every not, not everybody's thrown into suddenly maybe like you were and now take care of uh, ten people and you know I don't know. Um, in terms of closing comments, there's a, there's a great question here, which is just about kind of characterising Kirsten's leadership style. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, to Jan and Eduardo, if you could kind of sum up um, her leadership style, and maybe you could you know, look, look at it in terms of... <laughs> Thank you very much. Or maybe, maybe the aspects of her leadership style you, you hope to learn from yourself. That's how I delegate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Kirsten is very demanding but also very fair and that is something that I appreciate because I am also very demanding and very fair I think I'm demanding of others but also of myself and um, what I what I am still learning is that I am I set very high standards for everyone and when I make a mistake I have difficulty accepting that and sometimes I get lost in making the mistake and forgetting that it's not about a mistake it's about what you learn from it and fixing the mistake and that's something that, for example, by, by coming into this environment where both Kirsten and Eduardo on their levels are very supportive, you learn that it is all right to make a mistake. No one is perfect. It's impossible, especially in our profession. There's so much going on, so much change, so, much, so many things you need to think about at the same time, that it's important that you, that as a manager, I think, you understand or make people understand and understand yourself that it is fine to make a mistake and that is part of the design and the building process. And this, this demanding but fair, I think they're very, very important qualities for a leader. And I see them very much in both of them, so that's, that's why I like to work with them. Eduardo, you've had some thinking space now. Can you yeah. share your thoughts? Um, I suppose uh, it, it's all a matter of predicting the reaction of the person you work for. It, and, and, feeling confident that you know how that person is going to react to something, preempting when something you know is, you know, substandard and you have to explain why, and knowing uh, to be sure of whenever you have done a good job, etc. So the fact that Kirsten reacts predictably to things uh, m most of the time helps. It helps a lot. Is this, are you... you is it, okay, consistently. Uh, the fact that I feel... <laughs> But I, I can predict how she's gonna how she's gonna uh, react to some things, you know. Uh, but yeah, consistently. Uh, that that really helps. Um, but in the end, again, maybe something that's fine with me, like uh, being slightly um, exaggeratedly so um, maniacal about how you pin up. Uh, I can deal with that. Maybe somebody else can't. And yes, like if you if you don't pin up straight, some people don't care, some people do. And from the smallest thing like that to to the more important decisions, it's uh, important to, just to know who you work with. I, I and I think I kind of know Kirsten enough to to try not to let her down every single time, just half of the times. 
on that note, um, there's obviously lots of fantastic questions coming through, and we'll try and pick up some of those in the resource pack.